الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا قيبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله وصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كيف حالكم جميعا يا أيها الإكوة أقوال وبرابز السيسس في الإسلام والحمد لله إن شاء الله تعالى hopefully this particular talk will shed some light on the actions of Nafis Abu Zayd in regards to his stake in dealing with a lot of the different things that transpire within the communities or within his own community in the communities at large with the different du'ats of uh, the du'ats amongst the du'ats or the different callers amongst the du'ats of Islam here in the West Fil Um Alhamdulillah it has been brought to my attention that the talk that I've gave or have given in regards to the Masjid Wars and many talks I gave before especially with you know shooting off from the night shift and things like that it seems to cause more trouble or cause more confusion or I'm just someone who is pretty much seeking fame or I'm someone who is a troublemaker um, so to speak so I would like to address that issue hopefully inshallah uh, to clarify some of the views because I can't you know I want to just mention the statement of uh, Iman Shafi um, that is a tribute to him rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, and that is that you can never please everyone right it is impossible to please all people no matter who they are just you're just not going to be likable to every single one to every people so I like to believe the position that I take is from two standpoints when I you know say something or when I use the platform that Allah SWT have given me to use and to speak I like to think that I am coming from two positions one from the position of nasiha nasih which falls under amru bil ma'ruf wa munkar which falls under commanding the good and prohibiting evil Right as an advisor, I believe, inshallah ta'ala, hopefully, we'll be establishing that. That's one position. The other position is I like to think that, inshallah ta'ala, that the position that I take is from Islam, is to bring about Islam, bain and nas, to bring about rectification among the people, to bring about medication in this case, among the du'at, among the callers, inshallah ta'ala, ta'ala Islam. I think that's the position that I take from those two standpoints. However, there might be brothers from amongst the du'at that do not. So I would like to mention that, and I also like to mention the statement of one of the salaf, that they say that Amr bin Ma'roof wal nahiyan munkar ma taraktali sadiqan. That commanding the good and prohibiting evil has not left me a friend. Has not left me one friend. Commanding the good and prohibiting the evil. So with that being said, I want to say to you guys that our beloved brother and he is our brother in Islam, and just because I use beloved, because yes, I'm fond of the brother, but that doesn't mean I have a personal relationship with the brother. And that is our brother, Dr. Tarha Wyatt, and our brother, Muhammad Munir, and our brother, Shadi Muhammad. I do not have a personal relationship with either of three. And I have not contacted any of them before I did the talk. And I have not spoken with them as to their opinions or the encouragement to do or not do the talk on the Masjid Wars, or any of the talks that I gave for that matter. And it's not like as if they have put some battery behind me to do that. And it's not like they are in agreement uh, with me that I did it. So I want to make that clear. So for any party that's listening, that they think that because I mentioned those names, that I'm somehow trying to either get fame or trying to get any good graces or they're somehow behind me and pushing me to, you know, uh, advocate. The reason why I bring up those names and why I'm so consistent on those names is because me personally, those names have something to do either indirectly or directly with a lot of the chaos that have occurred amongst the du'at. You understand? A lot of people have been separating due to the fact of someone either listening or uh, reading or taking any information from any of the three people I've mentioned. And a lot of relationships has been broken due to that whether in the masjid, amongst the administration, a whole masjid will be taken off of the Dawat al-Salafiyyah because of their uh, 
dealing with any of one of those personalities. So that's the reason why I mentioned their names. It's not because they're telling me to. It's because I realized that it's very oppressive. It's very unfair. And it's not Islamically right from any position that a person can take a whole masjid or a community and place them and separate them and cause chaos in that community based off these individuals alone. That's not permissible. And there's no scholar, Allah Wajid Allah, that can bring an, an, a clear, illicit proof that this is the case, that you can do this. Let alone, there's no scholar that anybody brought that ever said do this. There's no scholar from amongst the duats that they use to set do what they're doing and what they have caused. They have caused devastations in many of the communities by doing this and making us choose between personalities and not having, dealing with s or so dealing with different personalities. So that's the reason why I mention it. So just stay the course. I want to rant. I want to stay the course what I have prepared. Now, so understanding that, that's I wanted to make that disclaimer. The next point is I want you to understand is that the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says in a tremendous hadith, that applies to every last one of us not just the callers of Islam it applies to all of us in a certain way according to our ability but Allah Jalla wa I mean the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says the hadith is reported by Abu Ruqayya this is Kunya the noble companion Tamim ibn Aws Ad-Dari Radiallahu ta'ala anhu he mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Ad-Dinu Nasiha and he said this three times he said that the religion is sincere advice alright the religion is sincere advice the deen is sincere advice. Kuna, we said, Liman ya Rasulullah, to whom, O Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet said, Lillah, Wali Rasuli. Right? I mean, Lillahi, Wali Kitabihi, Wali Rasuli. To Allah, to His book, to His Messenger, Wali A'immat al Muslimin, Wa Ammatihim, and to the leaders. And also the commoners amongst the Muslims. Five things were mentioned in this hadith. Five. By the permission of Allah Jalla wa ala. And this hadith is collected by Muslim. Imam Muslim collected this particular hadith. That advice, the deen and nasiha, is to be given to Allah, to his book, to his messenger. Also to the leaders of the Muslims. And a part of that, of the leaders of the Muslims are two. As the ulama have explained, Umara is of two. That's the ulama and as the leaders. All right? That is the leaders of Islam and that's also the ulama. And the ammatihim. Okay? I just want to bring one statement to the end of the explanation of to that tremendous hadith to help us understand it. And this is from Sheikh Salih Ali Sheikh Afidhullah. He says at the end, in concluding to his tremendous explanation that he gives to this hadith, he says, وَكُلُّ حَقْ he said it is the right to a Muslim to another Muslim. It is the right, right? All right. It's for what? For every right. It's deserving that a Muslim to another Muslim is entered into this in regards to giving nasiha to the general Muslims. For the word nasiha that is used in this hadith, it is a comprehensive and inclusive a uh, word that embodies a lot in regards to nasiha dakala fiha jamil hukuq shar'iyya which is included amongst that is the all of the rights or the legislative rights that belong to Allah to his book to his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the leaders of the muslims and to the common folks fa ya kalimatun nadhima jamia for really it is a great tremendous and comprehensive word jamia hukuq jamia lima fihi khair dunya wal wal akil alladhi qama bin nasiha and it also gathers all of the rights um, that contains within it the good within his life in this world, as well as the hereafter for the one who established this nasiha. And every person who neglects to carry out this command from the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Sheikh says, indeed have caused something to be neglect from nasiha that is obligatory, then Allah's help is sought. Alright, so that's one of my positions. So when you hear me give the talk, the masjid wars, it wasn't because I was against Germantown. I want to make that clear. No, I don't pretty much agree with a lot of the things that they do. That's true, and I'm not going to hide that. And I don't have to. Do you understand? I don't have to. But still, nonetheless, 
It wasn't because I wanted to go against Germantown Masjid or I wanted to go against S Pubs or I wanted to go against Masjid Bin Baz or anyone associated with that ilk or I wanted to go against Masjid in Camden. All right? That's not the case. I don't want to find a chance to pounce at anyone from that side of the, you know, from that side of the camp. No, that's not. I don't agree with a lot of the tactics that those brothers use and a lot of things they do. I don't. And I don't listen to them. I don't go around telling people not to listen to them, but I don't listen to them. It's just me. From the things that I witness, I don't have to. Allah bless me to understand Arabic. I can listen to the Sheikh directly or I can listen to the brothers that I feel comfortable enough with their adab and the way that they come across that it's not no extremism that I don't see go against the book and the sunnah for me. Do you understand? So that's normally what I do. As far as the other side, if there is the other side in this, I'm not all peaches and cream with them neither. I'm a lone wolf. You don't see me on anybody platform but my own. You don't see me with any of the other brothers. They don't call me to do their khutbahs. They don't call me to do anything. You don't see that. So it's not that case. All right? I'm not jumping around trying to get brownie points with those guys or this is now. I'm not that. And I don't agree with everything they do either. Do you understand? I don't agree with that. But I don't believe that it is at the point that people make it and the brothers have made it that anyone who associate with those brothers, that anyone who deal with those brothers, whether it be a masjid or community center or a community, whether that you have to be totally ostracized, totally abandoned. I don't agree with that. I believe that's extremism. And I don't believe that there's no proof and evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah for that action. So I speak against it because I'm commanding the good, forbidden, the evil. I'm also advising my brothers to stay away from gulu, extremism. I don't believe that that's the case. Shadid Muhammad, with all of his flaws, and everyone have flaws, still doesn't give you a right to ostracize a whole community or, which, or to oppress the brother himself. It doesn't give you a right. It don't give you a right. Tahir, same thing. It doesn't give you a right, regardless who they work with. If he worked with Yaqeen Institute, that's between Tahir and his Lord. And if he's moving with knowledge and he's moving with assurance, what he's doing, then that's what he's doing. But it's not give you the right to say, oh, now he's Ahlul Bidah because we seen some stuff from the Yaqeen, uh, Yaqeen Institute and they do X, Y, and Z. That doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we all going to be questioned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I believe Sheikh Wasil al-Abbas tried to explain that to Bilal Davis and Abu Khadija who seemed not to get the point. The Sheikh was telling them, they was trying to say to Sheikh Wasil al-Abbas, they tried to say to him. They said, Sheikh, if there's a group of people getting together and they're all together and one person on that flyer is at that group, on that panel, is a Sufi. Right? This is what Sheikh Wasil al-Abbas is saying to them. And? So is a Sufi. Okay. You're there to call to the dawa, you're here to talk to the, the call to whatever the topic is. Does that make you Sufi now because you're sitting on a panel with a Sufi? It doesn't. There's no proof and evidence. It doesn't exist, brothers and sisters. It doesn't. There's no proof and evidence to say that because you sat on a panel with a Sufi that makes you Sufi. What are y'all doing? That doesn't. It's no. It's none of that. There's no proof on it. Now, if you want to take the the high road, if you call it that, and say I'm not going to sit on a panel with the Sufi because I don't want no one to be confused that I am endorsing the Sufi then Alhamdulillah but you can't make income of your brother who now takes the golden opportunity to speak to a group of people to convey the message of Islam in the pure Preston understanding of the Sunnah of the Fahm Salaf because he used a panel that it was a Sufi on the panel and he used at that time to give that you can't Turn around and say, now I'm going to make incarnate. And this is what Sheikh Wasil al-Abbas was trying to explain to them. This was actually on tape. And these guys still didn't get it. Which caused the Sheikh to warn against them. Because he felt as though they was extreme. You understand? You, you're extreme. Like, look, look, you say, and they spoke ill to the Sheikh and said whatever they wanted to say about it. Because you're extreme. That says extremism. You understand? The Prophet Wasallam borrowed from a Jew. Did the Prophet Wasallam sympathize? Did he have love for a Jew? No. You either read Bukhari. Read the Hadith, man. Go back and read it. He borrowed from a Jew. Does that make the Prophet Sallam in love with the Jew? <laughs> He's promoting Jewish Judaism. Did he actually, you know, endorsing them? No. Where are we getting our fahm from? You cannot, I'm telling you, Wallahi, that's why the Hadith is so golden. Man, you read Allah who be khayr, you fakihu fideen. It's so golden. Whoever Allah wants good for, he can give him thick, man. True understand, true understanding. 
we are only getting impressions of scholars from people that we're looking at with stars in our eyes. These guys might say they are the ambassadors of the scholars, but in reality, I got so many statements from the scholars themselves that they are not the true representative of the scholars themselves. There aren't. I'm sorry. They just not. Because they can mix, misconstrue, misapply, misunderstand what the actual Sheikh was saying. You understand? And now people are going around feeling some type of way, thinking that the Sheikh actually endorsed that, and the Sheikh didn't actually say that. We just read this to you the other day. Sheikh Tamim was talking about that when we were talking about what? Verifying information that you get. How he even actually passed from students doing it to scholars. Saying that the scholar said something that he didn't say. This is normally what we see. So this is my position from that. That I stand on that, that regard. So I wanted to mention that I don't believe that I am causing trouble when I stand out amongst my brothers and sisters because the community wants to know what do they have to do with all of this. Brother Fulan went to Yemen. Okay. Brother Fulan went to Mecca. Okay. They both study. Okay. They both have something they can give back to the community. Okay. Now why do I have to choose between the one who went to Yemen and the one who went to Mecca? Why? Why is that my issue? If the one who went to Yemen and one who went to Mecca didn't like each other personally, why do I have to make it seem like it's a dean-related issue? And if it is a dean-related issue, how was it handled? Was it handled properly or not? Why do I have to do that? Why are you making me choose? Why are you causing separation between a sister and a sister, a brother and a brother, a mother and her children, and a father and his children? Why are you causing these type of chaotic situations? Individuals are running around speaking ill to their fathers, pulling guns or telling them I'll get your gun the next time I see you. And you are in the arena of calling people to Dawa to Allah? That's crazy. How do that add up? You're on platforms. You're calling people to Allah. And you think no one's supposed to advise you against this. No, you're wrong. You're calling to Allah. Huh? You're a graduate student. And then you talk to your father that way? As if you didn't read the verse itself when Allah says, Fala taqul what? Ufin. Don't say oof. Go to all of the fasir. I mean, you want to read all of them? We could go from court to me. Go for a tabiri. Whatever way you want to go from. None of them will give you the right to speak to your father in that way. None of them will say that that verse indicates that you can speak to your father in that way. Never. But yet you telling me I should recognize your fuddle over me because you went to a university and this is how you behave when you came back? Well, I don't want that. I don't have to recognize that. And that's the point what I'm saying. We as people don't have to recognize that. It's bad adab. It's su adab. That's what it is. And it's a contradiction to what you're supposed to be upon. And it's a gang mentality. What we see what brothers are doing. You got to roll with us. The hawk is really with us. Who talks like that? No one. The truth holds you up. You don't hold the truth up. Don't you understand this principle? The truth holds you up. You don't hold the truth up. Never. You only got the izza from Allah, not from nothing else. If you got izza from anything other than Allah, that's not true izza. Do you understand? That's not the izza that Allah is talking about in the book of Allah. Find me in any tafsir that it says that. None of that. So we're dealing with people who got gang mentalities, who have caused devastations in their wake. Another individual who graduated, by the way, he's in Delaware. He goes to one masjid in Delaware. He's the imam there. Or he's working with them. And then what happens? He's no longer with, whatever the case, he's no longer with that masjid. He goes over the block to another masjid in the same city. To another masjid in the same city. Now he's now telling people in the new masjid, in the same city, don't mess with the old masjid that I was there too. And that makes sense? Under what circumstances does that make sense? What happened? Did they turn Sufis overnight? Did they turn Shiites overnight? Did they turn people who rejected the book of Allah and the Sunnah of Muhammad overnight? How did it happen? The only thing that happened is y'all had a fallout or whatever the fallout was or disagreement and you're no longer there. So now you're telling me you call into yourself and not to Islam. So now I don't need to like that masjid no more because you're no longer the imam there. And we go for this. We have people go for this. Call a spade a spade. That's what it really is. You guys are running around acting as if you are the truth. You guys aren't the truth. Newsflash. You aren't. I'm sorry. And the moment that we start really learning to stop waiting for somebody to come in front of us. Stop learning. 
I thank Allah Jalla Allah give me that. I have my own library. I can read, man. And I'm not going to let nobody tell me anything. A brother met me and told me to stay away from Munir. I looked at him and said, yes, brother, I hear you. But you're going to bring me one ayat. Bring me one hadith. Bring me one dalil. And I don't want to hear a cold, a cold a statement from a scholar that was some mystic twisted of fatwa. I don't want to hear it because I'm not going to ride with that. I know that's not dalil. I understand in the books of Usul al Fiqh, they already explained to me what was Dalil. That isn't Dalil. So I'm not going to take it. The brother only can smile. The brother smiled at me and he said, Alhamdulillah. Right? It's the only thing he could do. What else he could do? I'm not going to be a guinea pig. You're not going to tell me whatever you want to tell me. And I can't deal with somebody. Like, what are you talking about? And that's how we need to be with these people. They are not the truth. They aren't. Allah Jalawal is al haqq Al Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is al haqq The Deen is al haqq that's what Allah tells us. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in that dua when he would say when he leave, when he get up for night prayer. But he never said that a tolerable, a student, no matter what level, because we get back and we think that a student is a high caliber student. None of these guys are high caliber students. None of them. And I'm going to be honest with you. Now you don't like me saying this. It's my personal opinion. I don't believe that they are. I believe that your adab will make you a high caliber student even if your knowledge isn't a lot. It's proficient. Even if you're not the most smart individual, but you have the good adab that is based on it, that surpass. And I don't make this statement lightly. I make this statement from a statement of a scholar who we all respect. Ibn Uqayyim, in his book, he already says, Men thaqqaqa, whoever, men thaqqaqa, whoever surpasses you, fil khuluq, in good character, and mannerism, have surpassed you in deen. This was his statement. But he didn't just say this. He got it from the Prophet ﷺ, who says, <laughs> That really I only been sent to perfect the moral character. Do you not understand? So at the end of the day, if your character meets up with the knowledge you say you possess, then that's when we're going to respect you, brother. The respect you want me, man. I'm not going to respect you because you call yourself a Talib or Ilm. You should fear Allah. I wouldn't be running around calling myself no Talib or Ilm. I'd be asking the Lord to accept my Talib, accept my seeking, and make sure it's correct. I'm not walking around talking, yeah, that's the student of knowledge coming through. You guys, far from, to, from humbleness, man. Far from humbleness. That's why they call themselves Sheikh. And there's no problem now, because y'all far from humbleness. The Prophet was humble. Anybody that came to a circle where the Prophet was at, they didn't even know he was the Prophet. He didn't sit in the middle of the circle. This is truth. He didn't sit in the middle of the circle. You couldn't distinguish who was the prophet. This is humble to all there. Right? This is humbleness. And then you guys got a nerve to come back. And just because you went to Yemen. You wasn't the most prolific in that school. You wasn't the most prolific in that camp. It's already known. There were students there that were more well versed than you. But yet you want me to take my hat off. And I was to walk down with my head down. And act like you really the, 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 the da'i. Oh here come the da'i. This is the sheikh. <laughs> Allahu musta'an. Never. And that's what they don't like. So instead of us acting like we something, won't we just act humble and use each other to support each other? Okay, you're stronger than me in this area. Then inshallah ta'ala, we'll lean on you with that. You're stronger than me in this area. Then we will lean on you in that. And then if I'm good in this area, then we will lean on that. And then we can work together with harmony. That's normally what should be done. But that isn't the case. That isn't the case. And it's been like this for years. People not working together, which led me to think when we started to do the night shift, it led me to think that people have hidden agendas. And it's true. No, I don't know what's in somebody's heart. No, I don't know the intention of people. But I only can go by the actions as Ibn as us, as Umar ibn al-Qatab right there, I know so eloquently put it. We judge people by the law here. We judge people by what's open, what's apparent. You don't want to mend fences with your brother. He no longer your brother. Why? You understand? And I went to these brothers. Don't act like Nafis didn't do it. I didn't just get in front of the camera and start talking to you guys. I went to every last one of these brothers. I went to them. Dealt with them. Spoke with them. And I seen what I saw from them. And it's still at the same time, it wasn't like they were trying to mend any fences. It was strictly telling me, yo, stay in your pretty much your place. You got a little bit galoo towards you as far as extremism. Tar here, he's, I mean, this is and that. He's real sympathetic. No, you're just jealous of the man. That's all it is. There's no real haqqa or deen in it. You're just jealous. That's what it is. And you don't want me to tell you that you're jealous because it's a dunya we thing. You're jealous of the man. Tari was in control of him staying over there for 22 years. Sorry, newsflash. Allah was. <laughs> Allah was. <laughs> I mean, everything that Tari got, Allah gave it to him. 
I mean, and if he did something wrong or incorrect, Allah is going to deal with him. That's just clear. You know what I mean? I don't worship everything to our, so I barely half of the time get the chance to really listen to the. Yes, and I consider him to be a doctor because he has reached his doctorate, and I, I consider him to be a sheikh. All right? Well, alhamdulillah, not a sheikh like on the level of Fozan or any of those scholars like that. No, I don't. But still at the same time, I do believe that he have an academic achievement that he have acquired. Same thing with Muhammad Munir. I recognize that fadl, and I accept that. I'm not jealous of that. If anything, I'm permissible jealous of both of them in terms of that they have beat me to the punch of seeking ilm. And I wish that Allah will allow me to be able to have knowledge as these brothers possess. That's one thing. But I'm not going to go around and make it seem all like how it is, man. I asked Allah SWT to make us strong. So I wanted to bring some points that Sheikh Uthameen mentioned about bringing Islam between the people. Because that's what I believe I'm doing. I'm not a troublemaker. I'm not trying to seek fame. I haven't got paid from you guys. Ain't nobody pay me. You understand? To, to, to be honest with you, it was all personal. After we did the night shift, we uphold a lot of people in the night shift. Me and Isa, well, Isa, now that he's going, may Allah want to guide him back. But we uphold a lot of people. Brothers who wasn't even speaking for themselves, we upheld them people. And they don't even bang with us. That's the one that's the keeping the bean. Brothers don't even deal with Nafis. Hey, you, you get it? Nafis ain't really no student. Nafis ain't really this. That's the truth. And I don't got time to air that out. But I still uphold them, brothers. And I still ask Allah Subhanahu to support those guys. But I don't want you to think that that's what it is. I'm not against Somali. Or not against these guys. Those guys don't even pay with me. <laughs> there ain't no cup of coffee they're going to have with Nafis. So stop the, the nonsense. I'm not being a troublemaker. I'm being someone who sincerely want good for Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. Who sincerely want good for people who call to Allah. And I am against people who belittle anything that got to do with the deen of Islam. I'm against that. So when I heard the statement that they made, and I know Jalil is the one who runs um, Al Minhaj magazine. And if he didn't put this there, then, you know, he didn't put this there. But I know he runs it. So in terms, when they made the statement that said, we're not going to call it Masjid Mukbil no more, we're going to call it the Allegheny Masjid, I took offense to that. Not because of Imam Abdul Hafid. I don't even share coffee with him. Do you understand? I barely even go to the masjid. Right? But I got respect for him. That's my elder. I barely even go to the masjid. But on top of that, because you belittled the masjid, I was mad. You said we're going to call it Allegheny Masjid. You were trying to belittle Imam Abdul Hafid. But you didn't even do that. You didn't even, you didn't even belittle him. That wasn't, that wasn't towards him. That was towards the masjid. Whether you call the masjid whatever name you want to call it. Is it still not a masjid? So if we remove the name from Mukbil to Allegheny, is the masjid still a masjid? So when you say that, what are you trying to do? What are you intending when you say it's just an Allegheny masjid? No, it's still huge. No matter where it's at. No matter the size. It's the bait of Allah. Wherever the bait of Allah is at, it's still huge. You can't belittle that. So yes, I take offense to that. I'm offended by that statement. And every Muslim should. You hear someone downgrade a masjid, you should be offended by that. What is he talking about the bait of Allah like that for? Like, you don't understand. So that's my point. That's my stake. It's not that. So he mentioned here, he bring in the, 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 the fawaid. He says that to that tremendous verse I brought so people can understand clearly. Because a lot of brothers say, no, brother, you just causing more trouble with your talk. You're causing more confusion. You're stirring the pot. You don't have no stake in this. Where's the rectification you bring? This is what everybody, been, you know, I've been getting all these reports from people saying this to me. But I'm going to tell you one thing, right? It's, it, it, because you're callers. And these are people who I consider to be callers. If you're callers to Allah, you should know these proofs. Right? And you should know where I'm coming from. And I'm going to bring it to you why, I'm coming, why I said what I said and why I took the state that I took. And you can understand it here. Allah Jalla wa ala, he mentions that there is no good in many of their talks. There's no good in the people talk except if they do three things. So, in the fawaid, the benefits extracted from this verse, the first one is that Sheikh Uthameen, he mentions that there are many people who speak. And we all speak. There's many speech from the people. However, that contains no good in it. No, no benefit whatsoever. And we all know that. So what is the balance? What is the scale of a good speech versus a bad speech? All right. He says the answer is what has been mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu in his statement. Where he says, Whoever believe, believe in Allah on the last day, فَلْيَكُلْ خَيْرٍ أَوْ لِيَسْمُونَ then let him speak good or remain silent. He said, this is the balance. He said, this is the balance. And also in the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مِنْ Islam الْمَرْئِ تَرَكُهُ مَا لَيَعْنِي From the perfection and the wellness of a person in Islam is to leave off a matter that does not concern him. 
And some people can say, well, that hadith was against you, brother, because this issue doesn't discern you. You're not on none of the flyers. You're not uh, none of the callers that this is that, right? You probably can use that. You might can use that argument to say, brother, you this that. No, but I already gave you the hadith, and I'm giving you the ayat that you can bring islah, that you can be an advisor. So it does concern me. And it concerns everyone in the community in regards. So yes, I'm going to use my platform to speak out against it. That's the position I hold. This is the proof I'm using for me to do it. He says here, um, uh, and also in his prohibition, the Prophet ﷺ prohibition, when he says, when he prohibited the kila waqal, he said and she said, an abundance of um, unnecessary question. He says, so in these three tremendous narrations that he mentioned, all of them clarifies to us what is considered to be good in someone's speech. The second benefit is the virtue of giving sadaqah. Right? And that, look what the Sheikh said, Allahu Akbar. Look what he says here. And he says that from the angle from that is that when a person commands with the given of sadaqah, then he, in terms of his affairs, is good. So, fafa'ilu sadaqah min babu awla. So, if someone commands someone else to give charity, then that act in of itself is good. And then, how much more so or preferable for the one who gives sadaqah? You understand? For the one who gives sadaqah. Commanding someone to give charity is also a good act, and then also how much more so the person who gives it. He says the third benefit is the encouragement to encourage man to command with that which is good and that which is wholesome. What is ihsan? Because Allah says there is no good in their speech except for three things. Illa man amara bi sadaqatin, except for those who command that which is given charity, aw ma'arufin, or commands that which is good. Or islahum bainan nas, or bring rectification between the people. The fourth benefit is the virtue of the command to bring rectification between the people. I see brother Fulan and, 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 and sister Fulan over here have a problem. I see brother Fulan and brother Fulan have a problem. If I know I can come in and bring something to try to attempt to bring some good between them, I do that. Some people might say, well, brother, you didn't bring no good with your speech. It seemed as if all you was doing was hollering at this one and hollering at that one. No, if you really go back to the speech and take your emotions out of the situation, take it out. I spoke against the people who are doing the, <laughs> the talk at the masjid themselves, the name of the flyer, just to be justice. I spoke against that, right? And I do believe that the brothers... You know, alhamdulillah, have a good intention, but at the same time, it still can be tainted because it is like directly you're going against those guys. And they threw uh, our elder, Imam Abu, Abu Hafid, in, involved in that. And he had a choice, and he allowed himself to be involved and he used his masjid for that. And that's how them brothers see it. They see that those guys didn't have a platform in Philly, so they went to Abu Hafid, and they said, you all got a gripe against us, so now that you're going to use the masjid to come at us and make a, a, make a joint, they go right directly at us. That's how they're looking at it. You understand? So yeah, they feel some type of way. They feel like y'all attacking them. You're using the masjid to attack. And the community is like, oh, no, alhamdulillah, somebody exposing the extremism. But to me, I'm like, no, no. I'm not saying somebody just exposing the extremism. I'm saying that some of the brothers that's on that flyer was with the extremism, and they never apologized for the extremism that they was upon when they was with those guys. And I believe they need to be held accountable. That's what I'm saying. And brothers don't like that. I'm going to call a spade a spade. No, so if you truly want to show me that you really meant some, you really uh, is on a new, and you turned a new leaf, then why you don't have a good relationship with the other brothers that, that y'all been spearing for years? And I don't care if you never said Tar here wasn't an innovator. That doesn't give you the right to warn against him or to be with those people who said he was. I don't care if you didn't say that Munir was never an innovator. It doesn't give you the right to be with people who warned against them and speared their name. So now, all of a sudden, because they no longer with you, and you haven't been banging with them with 10 years, and et cetera, et cetera, that you now can get together and say, oh, we're supposed to rally behind you, because now you want to expose the brothers being behind Hadadiyah. But you was just with them. Whether it was 10 years ago or not, you was with them. So was you on Hadadiyah? It don't seem like you're saying that. That's my whole point. Spade a spade, man. That's my whole point. So yes, I'm being truthful. I'm not upholding these people over those people. No. I got a gripe towards Germantown. Yes, I do. I have a gripe towards the people, not the, the people of, Matt, of Germantown. You know what I mean. The administrators of those, and, you know, from the duas and things like that of Germantown. Because it seemed like y'all stirring a lot of trouble up, causing a lot of uh, devastation. When y'all going around calling people <laughs> innovators, man. When y'all going around ostracizing people, making people choose between personalities, making it seem as if y'all only got the hawk. Yes, that's a problem with me. 
That's something that I don't see from the ulama. That's something I don't see from the deen. I can't find one thing to support y'all. And in that regard, yes, I have a problem with that. So yeah, I'm going to have that great with you until you change that. Yes, until you guys change that, that's my great with you guys. And I won't take nothing from you until you change that. Until you show that you can be a better person and that this is really about Allah's deen and not about your deen and not about the reputation and not about the fame and not about the money and the revenue. And then we can actually work and build something. But we can't build nothing if you're sitting around calling everybody off it. And everybody got to come to you guys. I, I don't agree with that. That's extremism. So I think that both parties need to look at that. So that was my whole point with the talk. To try to bring that understanding. That I wasn't just speaking for one side or against another side. Okay, that wasn't it. And then the other point, I was trying to give a solution base. That we need to be more sincere. Realize what we're doing all of this for. If we're doing it for Allah, then we need to do it for Allah. And that looks a certain way. And that feels a certain way. And that comes off a certain way. And it appears a certain way. When a person do something for Allah. You can always tell when something is being done for Allah. Versus being done for another than Allah. And people will say well no you can't. Because this is something only Allah knows in somebody's heart. No you're wrong. There's a certain feel that you get. There's a certain approach that you get. From an individual who's calling to Allah. They don't want dissension. They don't want conflict. They don't want any this this and that. And we're not talking about dissension that is necessary. From shirk. And bid'ah, that's necessary. That's not causing conflict. If a person is upon true innovation, do you understand that we don't rock, we don't rock out with them? I understand that clear. That's not conflict. If a person's upon true shirk, polytheism, we don't rock with them. I understand that clear. That's not conflict. If a person's upon kufr, pure kufr, then we don't rock with them. I understand that clear. <laughs> that's not conflict. But if an individual is your brother, y'all then slept, broke bread with each other. Spoke with each other, right? Gave each other daps, you know, so forth and so on. Because this is what the case with all of these brothers. Y'all got to be truthful. These guys knew each other. I mean, some knew each other even good than the others. They really knew each other, man, seriously. And then now, all of a sudden, we supposed to take your word against his and his word against yours. And you tell me how that makes sense. And then we don't supposed to use our God-given faculty, which is common sense, that you guys had a fallout personally, and now y'all bringing it into the deep. We don't supposed to understand that. Right? And now we're going to get Sheikh Fulan involved. And then we're going to get Sheikh so-and-so involved. And, and now we're going to do all of this extra stuff and say, see how these guys acting? These guys are doing something towards the dean. They, do, they ain't doing nothing towards the dean. You guys are being personal. It's you. It got nothing to do with they doing anything towards the dean. And if they chose to move and maneuver a certain way, well, alhamdulillah. And if you really have the knowledge that you say you possess, then you're going to handle it in that way. You're not going to go around and make a spear campaign against one brother against another. You're not going to do that. You're killing our communities, man. You're killing. If you ain't going to help the communities, you need to go. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm hard on that. Guys are killing the communities, man. Look what he says here. He says, Fadila to Amr bin Ma'roof. Something that we forget. The very internal pillar of brotherhood, of sisterhood, is commanding the good, man, and prohibiting the evil. That's what holds up brotherhood and sisterhood. I guess it's a news flash. Not no brother and sister because I share food with you. Not no brother and sister sisterhood because we rock at the same, you know, matches, we go to the same lectures. Not no brother and sister because we wear the same clothes while I share this with you. No, at the time I can command you with good and prohibit you with evil. That's brotherhood. That's what holds it up. You doing something wrong, I, I can pour your card. You doing something wrong, sis, I can pour your card. And you don't feel no type of way about it. This is why Allah says what? That's <laughs> When it is said to this individual, fear Allah, he puffs himself up and get more arrogant. How can you get like that? <laughs> right? How can you feel some type of way of somebody telling you takillah? Honestly, at the very least, someone telling you takillah, even if you was right, you still going to stop and say what? Alhamdulillah. Because I always need to fear Allah. I always need to fear Allah. And brother, maybe you might don't understand where I was coming from, but I believe that this in this issue I have proof that I was correct. But I'm still... Barakallahu feet for telling me a taqillah. You get reward for that, I get reward for taking it. We don't have that understanding. Somebody tell us a taqillah, it's a fight. We tell another person, no, you fear Allah more. That's, that's, you, you will never find that, brothers and sisters, from a believer that understand, bro. You won't find that. They won't be making a statement telling you, you fear Allah more. It doesn't happen. And for those who want to use the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, when he told the man who was the head and the leader of the Khawarij, when he told the Prophet to fear Allah in regards to giving out the war beauty and he was saying the Prophet was being unfair, the Prophet told him that who fear Allah more, this was a true statement. The Prophet was not disregarding the taqwa Allah, 
but he understood where this man was coming from and he explained to the man who is alive from amongst the servants that fear Allah more than me. So I won't do injustice to anybody. So Allah, the Prophet was clarifying that. So that's not a contradiction still as to what I'm saying. Tell you, um, next one that he bring here, commanding the good man is a virtue. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa has connected it to the commandment of giving charity. Allah says, Illa man amara bi sadaqatin wa ma'rufu huwa. What is ma'ruf? He says, Kulu ma'arrafahu shara wa akarruhu fahuwa ma'ruf. Everything which the legislation confirms and uh, and have defined and have confirmed it, then it is ma'ruf. Wa kulu ma'ankaruhu. And everything which the legislation has confirmed and defined to be evil. And to be bad, then it's prohibited from that is munkar. He says also this the virtues of clarifying to us these three affairs that they contain within them good, and that if a person does them without seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa taala, right? Because you should do these things seeking the face of Allah, not seeking status and so forth. And this is what I fear the most whenever I go live. I fear this the most. Honestly, I do. What is I'm doing it for? Is I'm doing it for the sake of Allah? That's the condition. Allah says, "Wamein yaf al." Whoever does this, huh? he does this seeking the pleasure of Allah. Not so that Tari can give me a call. Yo, I like the talk that you did, man. You know, not so a Dua can give me a call. Not so that the brothers can say, yeah, come down here with me, enjoy with me. That's not what I'm doing it for. I hope, inshallah ta'ala, I hope that my intentions is pure and sincere. That I'm doing it for Islam. I hope that's what the case is. Do you understand? That's important because we have to deal with that. Every call I have to deal with the fact that whatever deed that he or she does, they have to make sure it was done sincerely for Allah's sake. That is a burden that you don't understand, that the people of the past understood. And this is why Ibn Khuzayma, in his book, Kitab al-Ilm, he brings statements of the scholars, many scholars who said, I wish I was a blacksmith. I wish I was this, other than a scholar of hadith, or other than a scholar of this. Why? Because it's now weighed on them. Everything they know they're going to have to actually uphold. You understand? So that's the problem. You're thinking that a person knows and learns and, and memorizes and all that stuff and look cute and everything like that. But no, they're going to be getting the worst. Because if they don't act off it, it's going to be a proof against them. You understand? So that should be some of the things that should humble us. We hope, inshallah. He says, He says, the point of reference here or the angle is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he have negated that good is in many of the speech or the secret counsel that they hold, he made an exception for these three affairs. And then Allah says, whoever does that, seeking the pleasure of Allah, we should give him a tremendous reward. So the Sheikh said another benefit is this shows us the obligation of being concerned with our sincerity. Something that I believe that many of the callers felt in the West. And I don't care what nobody say. I don't know what's in somebody's heart. That's true. I can't speak what your intention is. But I believe the way that we carry on and behave shows that we don't have a real proper understanding of sincerity. I honestly believe that. Because have we been sincere to Islam? Have we been sincere to the deen? And have we been sincere to the sunnah? We would carry our way out way better than what we're doing. And we're not doing that. Because it has been some tainted in our sincerity. Do you understand? How do you got a problem with a brother because he can do something that the scholars already made clear? That is a difference of opinions even amongst the scholars themselves in regards to. If a brother can go to a masjid that predominantly calls or predominantly that's not upon the sunnah and can give dawah there. And you got scholars who argue for this and there's no evidence that you know absolutely say you can't. How are you going to now make the people decide to say that the brother is off it? You know, you ask yourself, how are you going to do that? How do you spin that narrative? How? You, you, you get what I'm saying? And where's the sincerity in that? You don't really think that that's not sincere? And how can you be sincere to yourself if you're going to call yourself a sheikh? No, I'm doing well, you're not a sheikh. And nothing. Not age, not dawah, not, nothing. And to be honest with you guys, the person who calls to Allah have to realize Every call that we make, if it wasn't done sincerely for Allah, doesn't remain. Do you understand? So you don't know what remains for you. So how can you say, oh, I've been giving dawah for 22 years. So respect my seniority for giving dawah for 22 years. You should respect me because we are the ones who are the vanguards of the dawah and we've been giving it for 22 years. And how much of that 22 years were you sincere? And how much of that 22 years did Allah accept your dawah? 
And how much of that 22 years were you correct? And how much of that 22 years was it was correct and it was good understanding according to the book of the Sunnah and the Fahma Salaf? How? So if that wasn't the case, then you should fear Allah. And what you should be saying instead of, you know, give me respect for the 27 years or the 22 years, what you should be saying is you should be begging Allah for forgiveness and you should be begging Allah to accept it. Oh Allah, accept my dawah for 22 years. Oh Allah, I beg you to accept the dawah I gave for 22 years. That's the, pers the position you should take. Never take the other position of arrogance. Humbleness, man. We don't see it. Wallahi, we don't see it. All we see is a bunch of people measuring themselves. Oh, I studied with Sheikh so-and-so. How many years ago was that? And did you really study with Sheikh so-and-so? Because we got people in his camp saying that you weren't even the most prolific person there. Right? So how did you study with Sheikh so-and-so? Tell me. But you said you studied with Sheikh so-and-so. Right? And what do you mean? I'm not saying you wasn't there with the Sheikh. But don't try to use that as a tesquia and then everybody got to bow down to you because over 14 or 15 years ago, you was in Sheikh Mukbil camp. So now everybody got to bow down to you. No, Akhi. That don't work that way. Because Talib wa ilm, as Iman Ahmed said, is to where? He says from the... <laughs> he says from the mihbara ila al makbara. What did he mean? From the ink pot to the grave. So you're going to be seeking knowledge until you die. So if you study with Sheikh Alabani... 10 years ago, right? 20 years ago, right? Does it mean that now you don't need to continue to study? That all of your talibah stop? No, you got to continue to seek ilm until you die. And there's going to be positions that you're going to change. There's going to be information you're going to come across that you might have been wrong, that you weren't correct on. There are going to be ahadith that you thought were sound and authentic that you're going to find out they had discrepancies in it and they weren't sound and they weren't authentic. There are going to be fatawas that you're going to realize that go against that. Yes, as you continue to learn. Do you understand? That's what a talib or ilm is about. As a person who's truly trying to be a, worship, a, a servant of Allah upon ilm. That's what a talib or ilm is about. It's not a career. Even though we say it is, yes, but it's not a career. It's about you learning how to worship Allah upon knowledge. That's what it's about. And then you have to give Sadaqa off of that knowledge because as you learn it and you put it into pray, um, put it into play into practice, you have to call other people to it. But you're trying to really worship Allah upon knowledge. That's what you seek knowledge for. That should be the purpose. Not so that you can get a status. Watch out, Aki, here come the uh, Sheikh so-and-so. Oh, you mean um, the Da'i that was in Yemen for six months? When did he become a scholar? Who from amongst the early man recognized him to be a scholar? Oh, no, that's the Sheikh. You can't disrespect the Sheikh. He disrespect himself. I think he's disrespecting every person who reached the level of a scholar when he called himself a scholar. He's disrespecting himself and them. Because this is, <laughs> I mean, if this is not your bab, it's not your bab. Who goes around calling themselves early man? Tell me, who goes around calling himself a scholar? Who? You got Sheikh Alabani calling himself a Tawaitlib. <laughs> a diminutive form. I am a small, diminutive form of a student. You got Sheikh Fozan crying on camera. Saying that, you know, when they was telling him that the people benefit from your books and from, from your shuruhat, from your explanation. He's crying, asking the law to accept it. That I am nothing but a small, poor slave. You got, you got Sheikh Rathameen, the same thing, crying in regards to that. You got Abdullah bin Mas'ud crying when he found that the people were following him. Where is this humbleness that we don't see with the duat? Why we don't see this? Person will come out his crowd, he come outside. He see that there's a crowd out there. This is how the companions was. The Aimma was. They see a crowd outside of the door. They knew that the people were following them. They would go back in the house. One of the sellers of the past, the Aimma, he will go back. The Imam, he will go back in the house until he waits till the crowd disperse. Not us. We want that. We need that fame. We want that. So and so follow us. So and so get that. We want that. Come on, man. The community. My advice to you, last and not least to all of you, to the community. If you want this thing to change, then we need to stop putting people on pedal stools. That's number one. Start holding people accountable, no matter who's in front of us. And don't be intimidated to ask. Don't be intimidated to remind. Don't be intimidate, intimidated to advise. If you have a brother in front of you teaching, and he says something that doesn't sit well with you, and that he speak ill of another duat, or another caller, or another this is that, and there's no basis for that, then you question that individual. You remind him to fear Allah. And you tell them that we didn't come here for that. Can you stick to the top of the hand? Can you stick to the class at hand? We didn't come to hear you bash out Fulan and Alan. We didn't come here unless you got clear, absolute proof that so-and-so is an innovator. 
Then we can understand that. But I don't want to hear what you think you understand. And I don't want to hear a position that you think that he took or whatever mistake that you think that he made that now he's this. And when you demand more of that, and then they can't come and throw walls over your eyes. Stop being cool. We got a psychological defect. Just because someone likes skin or someone have light complexion doesn't make them better. And we're not speaking against people who like. But I'm just saying we got people, we do, we do. In the African American communities, we have a problem with that. As if we taught not to take from our own. But then when we see other people who is our own, they might be lighter. We think that, okay, he must know. No, that's not true. He could weigh people like Allah weigh them. Allah Jalla told us, in the akramakum at in the Allah yathqaqum. Indeed, the most honorable, the most noble of you in front of Allah is the one who fear Allah most. So we watch their character. Not what they say. We watch their character. And we watch it. You understand? We watch it. And we watch it like a hawk. If you see them behave in a certain way, that contradict that which they call to, then we know for sure they have fallen short. This is what we do. And we won't be hoodwinked. And we won't be actually be fooled. And no one can stand in front of us because he can speak a little bit of Arabic and he sound a little bit of Chris. And he got a nice soul boy. He's throwing a shemag. I'm not, in, I'm, that didn't impress me no more. I'm not impressed with that. We done with those days. What are we going to do to actually, you know, help the community? Because I got a, I got a 13 year old son right now who is more influenced by drill than he is. <laughs> he don't want to care. And when he hear this type of stuff, oh dad, dad, you beefing with masjid so and so. Big masjid, that's like the streets. I don't want to hear that. Why would he be encouraged to, to, to listen to that? He don't want to take for none of that. Y'all beefing like it's the streets. Right? You beefing like it's the streets. So at the end of the day, I don't want to take that. I'm going to go back out here and still listen to Lil Dirt. That's what I'm going to test my shake. I'm going to listen to him. And that's the truth. And y'all know this the truth. Most of our kids, that's what they want. But yet and still, we're sitting here worrying about Fulan and Alain who been in Yemen over six months ago or so-and-so who went to Egypt or so-and-so who graduated from this Medina or from that. They're human beings. Do you understand? They have to actually go through it like that because it's a monster when you come back here. I don't care where you've been at. When you come back here to the States, it's a monster. No more shelter. It's no more shelter. You're dealing with people who are actually dealing with so many types of addictions, so many types of depression. How do you deal with that? Are you prepared for that? You can't open a hadith and say, okay, this is the answer and the solution for it. It don't work that way. Do you understand? Person coming to you. I got a problem. I can't stop drinking. I can't stop smoking. I can't stop type popping pills. I have a problem. You can't open the hadith and say, well, you know, the Prophet will he prohibit that. You know, the person who died upon the death of, of Khmer, you know, they die as a mustard. You can't leave with that. That's not going to work. Do you understand? So this is what we're dealing with. So we need to be have more camaraderie, more brotherhood, more sisterhood amongst us to help combat. As Sheikh Alabani so eloquently put it, he said, I think it's going to take thousands of Mashiach to actually do the job. Not just one. It's going to take thousands of Mashiach. So don't put that burden on, oh yeah, Tar here back and we're going to put all the burden on him. He's just one man. You can't put that on him. You can't put that on nobody. You can't put that on Somali, anyone. You can't put it on one man. You just can't. You have to actually say, yo, y'all guys got to get yourself together. It's personal. I ain't trying to hear that. You call and get so-and-so, so what? And if the sister who's your sister, if she feels some type of way because you share Shadeed Muhammad video, so what? If they feel some type of way that you share Manir video, so what? If they feel some type of way you share Email Muslim Family Center, so what? If they feel some type of way that you're doing any of that, so what? They don't got no clear evidence whatsoever that any of these individuals are innovators, period. And you ignore them because you know that they're actually working with what? Not the true understanding. They're not. So what? Right? If an individual get up there and share someone who's calling to clear kufr or to clear shirt, worshiping someone, like that, do Cardia Jalani and all this type of stuff, then you have a problem. Yo, know, sis, we don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pray that. You know, this is, uh, let me show you some stuff that they got. Yeah, that's, that's kind of crazy. But Shadid Muhammad now, come on. When did Shadid Muhammad call you to worship the grave? i wait. When did Shadid Muhammad ever tell anyone else to do something that go against the Aqidah of Ahl Sunni to Jamaa? And newsflash. When you go back to the Quran, Allah Jalla tell all of the prophets to concern themselves with who? What did he tell them? Their people. So if you are from your people, right? And a lot of people don't understand that. Yes, you got people in faith and then you got your people. Bilal ibn Rabat, he was Abyssinian. And they made him know that he was Abyssinian. And the Prophet didn't remove the fact that he was Abyssinian from him. Right? Yes, he was Abyssinian. In other words, in our day and times, he was Ethiopian. In our day and times, he was African. Do you understand what I'm saying that? They didn't remove that from him. They didn't say, okay, are you Muslim now? Forget that you, you're African and you're Abyssinian. Forget all of that. No, they didn't do that. Where y'all getting this stuff from? So if a person, for example, recognize his people, 
There's nothing wrong with that. So if Shadid Muhammad wants to quote Malcolm X, so what? What did he quote? Did Malcolm X go against Islam? Did he go against, if if what Malcolm X and what he's quoting go against Islam? If Shadid want to quote a different author, you understand? Then what is it? The scholars do it all the time. Y'all don't even know that. Half of the poems that the scholars are quoting in their books are from Kufar people who have gave poems or poetry. They're not from Muslims. Right? And a lot of people don't understand that. But they show a shahid or a point, a linguistic benefit in the use of that poem. And y'all don't understand that. But we do it. We quote somebody who is a non-believer. And the first thing we want to do is, Ah, subhanAllah, you're quoting a non-believer. Man, come on, get over that stuff, man. Learn knowledge. That don't mean I'm supporting kufr. Right? If the statement was true and in align with that, then there's nothing wrong with that. If you utilize it for the point that you're utilizing for, there's nothing wrong with that. We got to get past all of these hang-ups that these brothers have put on us. Make us all spooky. That's what they did. They make it seem all spooky. You can't even be your culture. You can't rock the way you are. Like You're just supposed to forget who you are. I accept the slam, and now I'm supposed to forget everything. Islam never actually demand that of you. You're supposed to forget yourself? Forget what you knew for 25 years, and you're supposed to all of a sudden just turn over. Yeah, you got to wear thobes, and you got to have pins, and you got to wear this, this, and that. Now, for the females, a little bit different because they got to wear jilbabs. But the jilbabs don't have to be in the Middle Eastern jilbab. That's another thing, which is thick, which is understanding. That's another thing. They don't have to wear a Middle Eastern jilbab. Oh, brother, you shouldn't be telling the sisters that. You might be out of pocket. I know brother's going to feel the same way about this. Okay. Take it up with all the scholars that sister says this. Right? Long as it feel the condition of it, it's to feel the condition of it. But alhamdulillah, but if the jilbab that you got nowadays do fulfill it and you ain't got to go out your way trying to figure out how to put a tooth piece together and all that, then utilize those jilbabs. I'm not telling sisters to get away from the jilbabs. I'm just saying that, you know, you have to understand it's fiqh involved with all of this stuff. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to continue to call and advise and command that which is good and prohibit that which is evil and to continue to advise our brothers no matter who they are and to continue to uphold the truth even if it's against me. I'm not always correct. I mean, I'm, I'm not always correct and I'm not, I'm not the most knowledgeable from amongst the duads or from amongst the brothers. I might only consider myself a duad and I don't like to be called a talib or ilm. I don't. I really don't. I don't like to be called that. I like to realize that I'm just a striving poor individual trying to learn from Islam. And I got to live in this community just like you got to live in this community. But I'm tired of the billion. I'm tired of the back and forth bickering. I'm tired of the people actually ostracizing one another. I'm tired of our brother and our sisters looking at each other funny because it all depends on what masjid you go to or what diet you listen to. And that's sad. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of me making me don't like certain scholars' names when I hear it because it sounds distasteful because they allow themselves to be pulled in and dragged in with this nonsense. I don't like that. When you say a certain scholar name to me, yes, it's distasteful for me. I hate that. I don't like that. Why? Because you allow yourself to be pulled into this nonsense that's causing all this havoc over here. I don't like that. It's a shame that we don't have one institute. It's a shame. Yes, you might say we got masters and we got this and that. We don't have one institute, man. It's a shame. It really is. And it, it, it actually speaks against us. People who say they're academic and all, it speaks against us. Because if we truly were these people who are real prolific, then we're going to emanate and, and bring that forth. Whatever we said that was incorrect in our talk, inshallah ta'ala, was definitely from ourselves. Whatever we said is correct is from Allah. Subhanakallahu bihamdi ashadu an antastakutu alayk. For those who didn't pray also, inshallah, don't forget, you don't want to miss your whole time, so pray also, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I thank you guys for tuning in. Ask Allah to forgive me. Assalamu alaikum.